But we're sort of running out of space. We, it's the second or third month in a row where we've had um, we've had a full house. So this is really good. Um, for those who haven't been here before, this is Mobile Portland. Um, this is sort of the agenda that we would normally go through, although tonight we're going to skip introductions because there's just too many people. So please introduce yourself to your neighbor, meet people, network a bit. Um, just a little bit of background about Mobile Portland. Um, we meet monthly, the fourth Monday of every month, 6 p.m. This space, or a space to be determined that might be slightly bigger. Um, we meet on Mondays because there's an international organization called Mobile Mondays, and um, we wanted to honor that tradition. Um, they didn't respond to our email, so we ended up calling it Mobile Portland instead. It's the same basic concept. Um, we are platform um, agnostics, so we talk about Android, we talk about iPhone, we talk about free, whatever whatever seems to be things that people in the community are interested in talking about. This month it's iPad, obviously. Um, oh, before I forget though, if you're interested, there are two different ways to get announcements about the meetings. So there's one mailing list on the website. Um, you go to mobileportland.com, you can just get announcements when the meetings are coming out. Or you can join the Google group where there are discussions that happen about mobile topics. People exchange information about job opportunities or ask questions yeah. about how to get things done, um, that sort of stuff. So um, depending on your level of interest, I would recommend signing up for either. And um, the last time I looked, we've got, we've got over 400 people on the two mailing lists. So there's actually a fairly substantial community in the Portland area. Oh, by the way, um, we're going to do introductions. I'm Jason. Um, and we don't have time to do everybody's introductions, but um, that's, uh, if you're trying to figure out why this guy's talking up here, that's why. Um, okay, so some upcoming events for people who are um, interested. There's the iPhone Developers Group, which meets every month on a certain time to be determined. Um, and I put Seth on the spot last time, I don't think it worked too well. Um, and stuff has disappeared. So um, if you're interested, there's a, a, a Google group and you can go there and find out more information. Um, there's an Android group which Don Park organizes and Don is in the back corner. They meet on the second Monday of every month. Um, and at Lucky Lab, um, CTIA is coming up. And I need to get something out of my bag. Um, sorry. Um, and then we've got the next mobile Portland meeting. Um, there's a conference up in Seattle called Voices That Matter, um, which is going to be about iPhone and iPad development. People are interested in it. And they have a, um, a discount. So it's $4.95 before March 13th, but there's actually a $100 discount for this group if you're interested in using it. Um, and the code is PHBLOGS. Um, or you can see me afterwards and I can give you the discount code. But you can actually sign up for that um, with the $100 discount. Um, the other thing which isn't on the calendar here is that O'Reilly is doing um, some online uh, webinars for um, Android development. Um, and I've got some information here if you're interested in that. And those are free um, you know, introductions to doing Android development for those who are interested. Um, and then, of course, InnoTech is coming up. They're going to have a mobile track, and Web Visions is coming up, um, and they will have some mobile content as well. Anything else people know about in the next couple of months, event-wise, the Portland area? Mobile folks should know. No? No? Okay. Um, so, with that, we'll move on to content for this week, um, or this month. So we wanted to have a, a session to talk about the iPad, and it's really difficult to figure out what aspect of the iPad you would really talk about. Like, do you want to talk about whether or not it makes sense for a business to um, to develop something for the iPad? Do you want to talk about what what this means for publishing companies and book publishers and all of those aspects? Um, and what does it mean for the future of computing, design, web? Um, so we decided instead of having somebody try to cover all of those topics, we'd instead try to have five people cover each one of them a little bit and start the conversation. One of the things that was really great about watching um, when the iPad came out was that the Google list was full of people talking about it and sort of banging about what this means. And um, So my expectation is actually that 
after we get done having the presentations um, and sort of the talks that each one of our panelists are going to give, there's going to be a lot of conversation that will start with Q&A and then we'll continue for those who are interested um, over at Produce Row, which is a bar across the street where we'll probably be going afterwards. Um, so with that, I want to introduce and thank our panels for coming. So first we've got Raven Zachary with Small Society. Um, Raven uh, was one of the leads. We worked together on the Obama iPhone app um, and also has done zip cars and I mean, just Starbucks, all of these different applications. Um, also speaks quite a bit on iPhone development. Um, James Keller, who also is from Small Society, talking about design and UX. And um, came to mind immediately because I think, was it like, you were speaking two days after the iPad was launched and had to change your presentations accordingly? Yeah, I, I spoke to, to Kaifu, the com Computer Human Interaction Forum of Oregon, really soon thereafter. So yeah. Really territory. So I'm Chris Skaggs, who um, is, uh, also does web development as well as doing um, games, and one of his games has actually won a recent award, correct? Uh, back in the summer, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so iPhone game development. Um, John Maroney from Handmark, which does a lot of development, um, or actually they work with a lot of publishers, so he's going to be talking about publishing, and Dave Shamley, who's going to be talking about the future of computing. So, thank you all very much. Um, and Raven's going to kick us off. Each panelist is going to talk for like five to ten minutes. Um, Despite the fact that Raven has 10,000 slides. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then we'll take questions and answers afterwards. Okay. And apologies to the peripheral vision here around the, the post. Um, I'm Raven Zachary from Small Society, and I'm going to cover kind of a quick industry overview of what's going on with the iPad. And I apologize to John, who is definitely the expert publisher vertical on the panel. I have some publishing slides on here, but I defer to his wisdom. When it comes to publishing, that's what he does for a living, and I'm just more of a out person on the outside. So, jumping in, the first thing is, all of us know very little, because what we have to go on is a keynote by Steve Jobs, uh, an intro video, and some stuff on a web page, and some very smart folks who took a lot of photos uh, at a press event that was closed, media only, with some invite, some folks, in, generally in the gaming industry, a lot of folks who own game publishers were there uh, at that event. I encourage you to go there because this is all we really have to work on. We don't have a ship date. We don't have a pre-order uh, pre date. We don't have any of those details yet. Um, and if you're outside of the United States, you have even less to go on because they have no ship dates internationally and they have no carrier contracts in place for the follow-on version with 3G. There is a developer program. There's a whole bunch of content in there that none of us on the panel will probably be able to talk to you about because of a strict NDA. Apple had the same NDA in place when they first announced the uh, SDK for the iPhone. I would suspect um, that that NDA will be lifted either on the ship day of the iPad or shortly thereafter to allow for more discussions and collaboration amongst those of you who are not in the program. We're in a mobile age. In 1984, we had the Macintosh. In 1997, Apple released its first notebook the, of, the, of the new generation notebooks. Apple had portable Macs uh, prior to that, but really the ones we think of now as laptops. In 1997 and in 2007, we had the iPhone. So, you know, I really see the 90s as the, as the era, and just before that, back to 84, as the era of the desktop PC. The, the last decade really is the era of the laptop, and now we're entering into this era of the smartphone. You know, these three eras um, that Apple ha and many other technology companies have traversed over the last uh, 20 to 30 years. And this is a question that Steve Jobs post, uh, posed in his keynote about the iPad. Is there room for a third category device in the middle between a smartphone and a laptop? And the key criteria for success for this third category is it has to do a number of tasks far better uh, within this, either this, the laptop or the smartphone. And he mentioned some, web, uh, email, photos, video, music, games, and books, but also, of course, apps. So there are things that we can do with not just the larger form factor, but what's inherent in the platform that's new that we can do in a distinct way. And they also talked about Apple being a mobile devices company. Apple will still sell servers and Apple will still sell desktops, especially the successful iMac line, but you, Apple really is positioning itself as a mobile devices company, uh, focusing on laptops, smartphones, and this new category of device that we've known as the tablet for about 10 years. 
So in terms of numbers, over 75 million devices, uh, about 50-50 split between the iPod Touch and the uh, iPhone. At some point by the summer, the iPod Touch volume will exceed the iPhone volume, which is going to be a little bit of a different spin on things. Apple has been extremely successful at selling the iPod Touch at two main periods during the year. During the back to school buying season, because they're giving them away as a freebie with a notebook purchase for students, so over the summer, and as holiday gifts, either stocking stuffers or as Christmas presents. You'll see these two very large spikes in, uh, in ownership of those devices in two very specific parts of the year, two parts of a bell curve uh, during the year. We have zero iPad owners, uh, and we don't know how big that market opportunity is. And if you look at even a market opportunity of seven to 10 million iPads, which is a, a very large number of devices, that's still about one-tenth of the market opportunity of the iPhone platform. The same OS, but the iPod Touch and the iPhone have a common screen size, which means it's much easier for an application to run the same on those two devices than it would be for you to have the same experience on an iPod, iPad that you'd want to optimize for. So quick overview on content publishing, and again, my apologies to John, who probably will cover some of this stuff, and I, I defer to his expertise as this is what he's been doing uh, for a living. Uh, you know, really, when you look at mobile publishing models in 2010, there's this concept of the web as is on the iPad. These are specific to the iPad I'm talking about here. Provide the existing web through Safari. No, mo no modifications or optimizations required. There is a mobile optimized iPhone experience with a smaller screen. There's the potential to optimize mobile web for the iPad. You may, you know, it may be small amounts of changes, but in a 1024 by 768 environment, there are things that you may not want to do. There may be columns that you want to eliminate. There may be variable width things that you have in your web code that you want to remove. Uh, there's the native app for the iPhone, but the, even though the iPad will run iPhone apps uh, as is in a smaller screen or in a double magnification mode, there's the, the opportunity to really expand and to use some new human interface uh, guidelines that were made available for the iPad. There's podcasts. A lot of publishers are doing podcasting now. It's a free distribution vehicle through iTunes and other forms of audio distribution, whether that's a print publication or a TV station uh, is, or, do, or radio are doing a lot of podcasts. There's the new iBook store or variants from other folks, Barnes & Noble e-reader or Amazon Kindle. Uh, and then we all assume, many of us assumed that what we hear from Apple during its announcement of the iPad was some sort of framework or tool set for print publishers, whether they be periodicals or other forms of newspaper distribution, would have an ability to package up content in a way that was easily digestible and disseminating on the iPad. That was not made available by Apple. I think this is a huge third-party opportunity for folks like John, who does this service already uh, for mobile devices, and others who really are going to package up this type of content uh, for these new form factors. So really quick, I want to just give an example of LA Weekly. I have no con uh, connection to this group other than the fact that they make a good example because LAWeekly.com, which is a, an alternative news weekly in LA, is providing its content in three ways. They obviously have LAWeekly.com, where I can zoom in the full web experience on a small device. I have uh, LAWeekly.com mobile, which is optimized for the iPhone, the default view if you were to visit this website from your iPhone. But they also have a, an LA Weekly iPhone app, which is a native app available in the App Store, which is a different way of viewing that same content. Condé Nast did a, 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 a demo, essentially they put out, they were testing the waters around uh, uh, GQ magazine. It's just some interesting data that they published uh, recently about the number of copies sold. Uh, they, they considered this a success. It's not a huge volume of, of revenue, but they did see this as a success, taking their print content and providing it in a form factor uh, on the iPhone using a native iPhone app. The New York Times, uh, this is a quote from uh, Martin, who was at the iPad launch about uh, the, the power of the iPad, you know, the New York Times is pursuing a whole bunch of different ways of, of publishing content uh, on, uh, on mobile devices today. And they even showed off a new iPad native app, which is essentially a print, a form of print uh, layout, but is essentially a native iPad app that will be distributed on the App Store. So there's a whole bunch of ways of doing it. You can do, you know, content, uh, distribution from your magazine. You can provide services. In this case, on the far right, Portland's very own Night and Day Studios uh, doing an app called uh, Cocktail Compass uh, with a partner there. And there's the whole issue of paid apps versus ads versus in-app purchase. What's the way of monetizing this content? I'm going to do a talk on this at South by Southwest for any of you who may be going. I'll have a representative from the book publishing, the periodicals, the game industry, 
um, and the interactive web space talking about content publishing uh, on the iPad. And that's how you can get a hold of me, www.smallsociety.com, rave me on Twitter. And that is my talk. So uh, my name is John Maroney, I'm with uh, Handmark, we were formerly Free Range, um, we sold Handmark last year, and we um, exclusively work with content providers, newspapers, magazines, and websites, delivering them applications on all different platforms, um, all through the same system. Um, and what's really interesting about the iPad, well first of all, one of the things I just realized when you were talking, I just came back from um, the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, it's the biggest mobile show, and we spent all the time talking to Oranges, Vodafone's, um, as well as the Nokia's and, and other people in the world. And I just realized just now sitting here that no one mentioned the iPad, not once, <laughs> in all the conversations that we had. I don't know what that means, but no one mentioned it. <laughs> no one mentioned Palm either, but I uh, um, <laughs> don't know what that means. But, uh, so um, when we talk to the publishers that we work with, um, the newspapers, the magazines, um, the iPad is um, critical to what they're looking at, and it is not an extension of the iPhone, it's a completely new platform, and they're viewing it as that, and uh, they're saying, you know, in, in Raven's Buckets, the mobile web, that's not something that anyone even looks at at this point, from, from an iPhone or an iPad, um, and actually a mobile in, in general, that's the last on the list of the things that we hear from them. They want native apps on an iPhone, they want native apps on an iPad that works on an iPad, on Android, on BlackBerry. So um, it's, uh, it's interesting to see. Um, from their perspective, they're definitely not the same things, and um, we need to treat them as different, different things with new UIs. Um, the real opportunity that they see is in new ways to sell content and to extend some of the things that they're doing on the web today, um, extending video in new ways. And uh, I thought that the New York Times was a great um, inspiration for new ways to approach content um, on this type of a device. And so, uh, what I, from a publisher standpoint, they're all looking at it, they're all saying, yes, we want to have something on there, and it has to be new, new and unique. Um, from our standpoint, as a, as a business helping publishers, the most important thing about um, the iPad, from my standpoint, is, is the iTunes store, is the ability to have that one-click purchasing. Um, that's what, uh, you know, it's also the secret to the Kindle. And what's made the Kindle successful um, as an e-reader, uh, that's what's made the iTunes successful, uh, iPhone successful compared to the Android platform and BlackBook platform from a sales perspective. Um, and I think you're right, the opportunity to help people extend what they're doing and to make money at it is what all these publishers are looking at. Um, they don't see this as a, as, a, as a savior to their business in any way. They just see it as an extension of work. and all of those nitty gritty <coughs> interactions about how users are actually going to use the things that we create. So um, the first thing I'll say is, as Raven mentioned to reiterate, we actually don't know much. We have sort of a pros list that we know, and then there's a lot of things that people, various people are disappointed about. Uh, but at the end of the day, I actually really feel that, you know, you, you're reading a lot of the media that for people who have held the device in their hand, you don't actually understand it until you can hold it. And so for me, it feels a little bit about like a beautiful black hole of awesome, but I don't know yet, right? So, but I'm gonna tell you what I do know. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is that context is key. So the first thing I'll say is this picture of Steve. It was a very odd thing to have someone at a keynote like this where you're announcing this to a global audience and he's sitting there in a chair using the iPad. And that was very um, intentional on their part. Usually Steve is, you know, walking around and doing all this. But no, he was sitting. 
Um, and I think it's a very personal device, and I think there's also sort of a usage consideration about the best way to hold and touch. Uh, but I also think that intimacy is something that they did a great job of getting across both in this and in the uh, videos that they have on their website. So context is key. Now, when we first got um, word that the iPad was coming out, we were all really, really excited. All of our existing iPhone apps, they're going to work on the iPad. Yay! <laughs> Really big apps? <laughs> Not actually such a great idea as it turns out. So, um, these are my two favorite examples, one we're responsible for, which is the Zipcar app, where you can literally walk up to a Zipcar that you have a reservation and lock and pump. You might imagine with a full device, it's going to feel really awkward, right? This is another great app that I use all the time. It's a TiVo remote, essentially, on my iPhone. You're really silly at the form factor of the iPad. So I was thinking a, a lot about this, and when it comes down to it, when we're working with clients on the iPhone, there's two primary problems that we try to solve. One is how do you get the right feature set for a very, very, very small screen size? So how do you really winnow it down to just what's necessary? And the other thing is what's that mobile context where you're on the go, on the street, you know, in the subway, at the DMV? And those things aren't quite as relevant at, at, on the iPad. You have a much larger pixel size to deal with, and you're also probably going to be a little bit more stationary. You might be on the subway, you might be at the DMV, but you're certainly not unlocking your car. So you're solving a different set of problems, which is why the really big <coughs> iPhone app thing isn't going to work so well. So when thinking about it, also, I always ask myself, what would Steve Jobs do? And Apple, when they showed everything at the keynote, they didn't take any of their existing apps and just blow them up really big. They didn't show us a single example of that. Instead, they showed us completely optimized versions. And you can see echoes in terms of the UI. There's a lot of widgets that remain the same, but they are laid out in an entirely different way for an entirely different usage context. So lesson number two, um, Apple is really great if you're in their developer program. Um, you can actually get all of Apple's wonderful knowledge through something called the Human Interface Guidelines. They released this for the iPad, and if you are interested in developing for the iPad, I highly suggest that you join their developer um, program. It's $99 for an individual for a year, and you can have access to this wonderful, weighty PDF. Um, but sadly, I can't tell you any of what's in it because uh, the NDA. So, I have to be a little bit vague about certain things, but I will tell you it's already out there in sort of the public knowledge that I thought was useful for sharing. So, save being able to reference the HIG, as it's called, the Human Interface Guidelines. Um, it, I had a great talk with uh, one of the guys who was part of the Tapulous team. I don't know if you've heard of Tap Tap Revenge and that whole thing. Um, I actually, when Greg and I first started Small Society, we sat down at lunch with this individual and I said, I'm new to iPhone, give me some advice about the best way to design for this platform. Been doing, doing user experience forever, don't know anything about the iPhone other than that I love it as a user. And he just said, Apple has a bunch of really great apps. They've solved your problem before, so make sure you know all of Apple's apps inside and out, and use that wisdom as you're designing your own. So some of that is explicit, and most of that's in the Hague. But there's a lot of great interactions within Apple's apps that aren't specifically called out in their human interface guidelines. So a lot of people on the web, and I have to apologize for really, really bad pixelated screenshots, because most of these are you know, screen captures of a YouTube video and blown up really big. So, um, But there's a couple of really great <laughs> Flickr sets out there. Other people have done the hard work for us. And they've taken screenshots, and most of these in Flickr are annotated with notes about, so what's up with that little wrench up there? Why is it not the Apple gear that they use for, for preferences? It's probably in-app preferences, as a quote, well, we don't really know yet. Um, they've got an undo button. Usually that would be sort of, you know, hidden up in a file menu somewhere. It's very explicit here. That has a lot to do, I think, with the way that they expect you to save documents. There isn't a whole lot of explicit saving. It should just sort of save as you go. So um, you can take a lot of clues from the screenshots of the apps that we do know about, that we have seen. Um, some of the great UI things that we've seen is 
On the other iPhone and the Maps app, you've got a little, a little page curl. They've got a much bigger version of this, um, as you see here on the iPad. And this is the new Paint app. Um, and they've got some really nice UI here. So taking clues, that little black box you'll become really familiar with on the iPad, it's called a popover. Um, and so another thing that we've seen, and, and I have this a couple slides back, is the iPhone app, and actually a lot of iPhone apps that are productivity based, you go from a list view to a content view, and then you go back up to a list view and down into a content view. They've actually solved this with what they're calling the split screen. Um, when you're in a landscape, in the portrait, they usually take care of it with a popover. Um, but again, you can get much more on the screen, so you're seeing more interactive, less screens, but more data on one particular screen. Um, they've also really sort of taken on a new aesthetic with certain things. If you think about iCal um, on your Mac, it looks very, very different than it, this. If you look at your calendar app on your iPhone, it looks very, very different uh, than this. This is a whole new sort of interface in terms of warmth and texture. And I think it has to do, this for me echoes back that intimacy, you know, Steve in his leather chair with the iPad. It's very homey, it's very comfortable, it's very warm. It's not a sort of cold, blue-gray slick that we've seen in a lot of other um, Apple applications. Um, another thing we're seeing a lot of are what are called scrubbers. Uh, this is known as the loop. This is pages within, uh, this will indicate different pages within the page app. So you can quickly see essentially a thumbnail of different uh, pages within a particular page's document. Um, in calendar, actually I'll go back, um, you'll see across the very bottom, you've got a, what's called a date scrubber. So you can go through a quick amount of data very, very quickly. Um, so you'll see these take on different forms, but this is another design pattern we're seeing in a lot of um, the apps. Also, we've got a lot of new gestures, which is really exciting. So uh, it's sort of the inverse of pinching, where you spread and things come out. Um, so a whole new gesture. And then we've got this whole you never know which way is up thing. I don't know if you saw <laughs> Stephen Colbert. Um, when he was, was it the, the Grammys? The Grammys. The Grammys, and he pulled an iPad out of his pocket and the whole interface flipped. Everyone else was just kind of excited because Stephen Colbert is awesome. I'm like, it's flipping. It was really, really cool. <laughs> but then when I started to sit down to design applications, the one thing I noticed is that flipping is going to be the bane of my existence. <laughs> because for one particular screen, there are four very different states that I may or may not be dealing with. If there's text input, um, because you can have a soft keyboard or a hard keyboard and there's different orientations that all have very different design and interaction constraints. One that we really haven't been able to experience but that I wonder a lot about is I need a hardware keyboard. I'm very excited about the hardware keyboard but I think it's going to be a very awkward thing to go back and forth from something that's laying down or even propped up on something and it's going to be a strange interaction and I think it'll be a while before we all sort of develop our own comfort level with what orientation, you know, how we want our own personal iPad setup to be. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is I have realized that UX uh, best processes still apply. So application definition statement, this is something Apple asks everyone to do uh, when they're creating an app and it still rings true on the iPad. I still do wireframing, I still do lots of sketching, I still do persona work. And I still try to block off time to be productive because to build a great interface, you really have to sort of dig deep and really understand usage context um, and really know the subject matter that you're working with. You can look at what other people are doing. Some people are now posting this online for us to see, which is very exciting. Panelfly, awesome iPhone app, very excited about the iPad app. There are a lot of trends, again, that sort of physical sense is something that was big on, on the iPhone, it's going to be bigger on the iPad. And then if you have one around, Coco devs love UX as much as you do. I learn more from my developers than anyone else I know, and they're great. Um, there are resources which I can make publicly available later if you're interested in iPad UX. And thanks. Thank you. Oh. So I have to give Raven the credit for actually creating our phone for our <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but the other thing, if you're going to be designing for the iPad, even thinking about it, I highly recommend printing it out and understanding the form factor that you're dealing with. I was surprised. It's incredibly small. Um, and I actually like to put my wireframes out on this because it's all about that interactivity. And this is a form factor that we just don't know yet. So. Could you want to pass it around? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Chris Skaggs, so uh, I was asked to talk about web and uh, actually that kind of way about the first slide. The, the web, by and large, on the iPad, from what we've seen, is supposed to be no change at all. It's supposed to be just fit in that darn thing. And uh, we've been doing web now, probably most of the folks in this room have been doing some web. We've been a sort of exposed to web for a long time. Um, and so, kind of the, the big news about the iPad is that there is no news, um, at least on the, on the first uh, layer of it. But, because that is sort of a, a, a dumb way to start a topic, I want to at least extrapolate a little bit. Um, one of the things that you want to think about when you look at web design is, is that you, you basically have uh, you know, a very limited amount of input. And, and by and large, with the mouse, you've got one pixel, more or less, that you're tapping on. With, a, with the iPad, just because the notion that people are going to be tapping with their fingers, think about bigger buttons, that's sort of an obvious one. But, now think beyond that. So, I want to see some of the things that are coming out with iTouch, uh, with the iPad being some of the multi-touch. So right now, I don't think HTML can support that kind of thing. Um, but I think HTML5 can, if I'm not mistaken. If you have an opportunity and you want to measure through frames or some other design implementations, you can start having multi-touch uh, web spaces. And I think right now what we're looking at with tools like the iPad and, the, and uh, less the iPhone, but some of the netbooks as well, is that what the web used to represent was this window into this whole other world. And, uh, and the web has the sense of a place where information is stored. I still think is the magic of all the things that's going on. These devices are just giving us different ways to interact with that stuff. And that allows for a tremendous amount of creativity. When I, when I was so uh, impressed with the iPhone, and, and in our case what happened is that we were a web development company for a long time, but towards the end of 2008, 2009, you know, when the economy decided to fall into the toilet, you know, we just had tumbleweeds around our office and that was a bad place to be. Um, but all of a sudden, the iPhone came out and started booming. And what we realized is that all that space, all that stuff, that, that uh, content that people had started to develop for years and years and years uh, for their website was still there and still available. But what you had is a new way to interact with it. And I don't know if you guys remember when, uh, when the iPhone first came out, what I saw over and over again were that people just wanted to touch it. Like, it really didn't even matter what it was about. They would, I remember them taking this one, and, and this girl, Trisha, would be like, oh, look, look, like this, like this, like this, like this, like this. She was fascinated by the fact that you could rotate the stupid thing. And it took her 15 minutes to get over that. And then she won one of her own, and she got one. So there is a form element to what's going on, I think, in that the iPad is going to do this even more so. That, that, not that the content doesn't matter. That's not what I'm saying at all. But it's allowing for some ways to interact with content that has got a little bit boring for people. With website design, this can, up, this can uh, bring up some opportunities where, where you're going to see some sites now that even though they're at a URL and a web address, that they're going to be designed specifically for the iPad to take specific use of this inter interactivity. So whether it's the rotation, whether it's the multi-touch, whether it's the ability to kind of pinch and zoom and all this kind of stuff, these don't have to be built into native iPad applications. And so any of you here who have sort of a web background, start stretching your mind about what you can do with HTML5, um, with some of the new interactivity, um, just with the, the interface itself. I think there's some really fantastic stuff coming up. Um, and that brings us into, into one of the other topics that I was asked to talk about, and that's gaming. Um, along the time where, where we got into the iPhone with, uh, with web, and that kind of brought into some other stuff, we got into the gaming things. Obviously, gaming on the iPhone was, was the big news. You know, everyone and their mother had an iPhone game, and uh, my mother didn't have one. And so that's why I need to get in the business and uh, help that out with mom. And, uh, and so gaming's a big, a big topic here, and it still remains uh, probably the biggest category on the, on the App Store. When we started seeing the, the iPad, people started asking us about, um, about the gaming experience there. The biggest thing, I think, is that if you, if you start with a 3D environment in, in, the, in your iPhone game, or whether you're using Tor or Unity or something like that, I think by and large you're going to be able to just reformat your camera, and you're going to be able to save a lot of the same content, assuming you've got the resolution. Uh, to support it. If you went with more of a 2D, uh, like a platformer game or something like that, now you've got some new, uh, some new challenges as far as how that displays um, in a much larger space. So stuff that was a little itty bitty in here and you had to do some weird UI stuff with just 320 pixels. 
And I've got a lot more stuff. That's a lot more detail. Don't just blow it up. Like you said, that's a bad idea. Get a chance to really use the best of what you have. But the truth of the matter is that uh, we have a, a, a 2D game that, you know, we can blow it up to the iPad, but it's probably not the best use, and it wasn't designed for that. Um, we saw that first when we were uh, we were looking at porting it just to uh, to the PC and to the Xbox, where we realized that we designed into this whole, and not that, that was a bad thing, but all of a sudden when you restart working your your uh, your whole interface design for a much bigger thing, you want to make the most of every pixel you got, and that. If uh, if the iPad and every indication is that it's going to look gorgeous at that at that screen resolution, man, make the most use of that. Um, I think one of the things that we've seen with uh, with the iPhone and kind of just Apple customers in general is they have a real high value for the aesthetic. They have a real high value for what looks good. And so stuff where it was just great boxes like Minesweeper just wouldn't fly on the iPhone. And almost purely from a visual standpoint, it's not about it's not about gameplay. It's about if you made the uh, Mind speak for that same game, but it looked good. I think the Apple audience would be a lot more interested in it. So that was something that, that we've seen a lot, and especially we don't just build our own games. We we do a lot of contract work for people, and uh, and for them this this uh, this form factor, <coughs> this, uh, this ability to look gorgeous at 163 DPI, that's really really important to them. I think also the gaming thing is probably where I'm most excited about the iPad. Because what we just started to get some glimpses at um, in the last six months is location-sensitive gaming, um, and so you know maybe geocaching was one of the first places where people started to see this. Is I'm standing in the mall and all of a sudden I can log in, or you see Foursquare where I can log in uh, to a different location. But now people are starting to tie these together, so I have location sensitivity. You know I'm tying that into my friends and Facebook and and where are they located. All of a sudden we're next to each other and we have this sort of flash mob kind of thing going on. You see some really exciting stuff with this little, where's my little phone cord? Or hold that up. You can just imagine all of a sudden with this guy, this is at a, a level where the netbook never was in it, as far as just being accessible. I can be walking around anywhere, it's just you know, slipped into a messenger bag or a big purse or you're a mom or whatever else. Um, and, and you're just playing some of the little games. Like you, know, you find out that your friend's across the, the mall or that you know, the other kids are on the other side of the playground. And it makes a little game. And so you're playing Marco Polo on your iPad. This kind of stuff is getting really, really exciting because it's simple to do programmatically, but it gets people to interact with their world and stuff that they didn't have before. Um, one of the things that was really surprising to us demographically when we started looking at netbooks, obviously a different, a different profile, was where the folks making those things were really expecting um, a lot of mobile business people to use S folks on trains. They want to do work on their way to on, uh, on their way to the job, that kind of deal. But uh, but there's been a whole lot of soccer moms and tweens who buy those little netbooks, and they make them as fashion accessories. And so when we were at CES a couple months ago, we saw so many variations on the whole netbook thing. And, and, uh, and obviously, tablet computers were a big, big deal down there. The iPad hadn't been launched yet. But there were a lot of folks really pitching this because they're trying to get into this space. And uh, I want to suggest that what I saw with the iPad and what I expect is that uh, it's going to do, it's going it's to cross that barrier of making it easy. That, uh, that the iPhone did for mobile computing, where obviously that was a big deal for a lot of years, but it took something to push over the level where it got into the general awareness at a lot higher level. And, uh, and I expect that will do the same thing for that netbook category. That's probably about 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> technology and makes it available whenever you want it. It's a PC that is virtually without limits. 
Within five years, I predict it will be the most popular form of PC sold in America. So that, I mean, I don't know if you guys saw the iPad coverage, a lot of people were talking about this. But this is Bill Gates in 2001. Um, so kind of, it's really, really interesting contextually to, you know, looking forward, to look back a little bit. Um, <clears throat> here he is with all of his tablets. And you kind of, you kind of wonder, you kind of wonder, you know, I mean, this failed. This failed, like, miserably. A lot of, a lot of manufacturers got into this. They were making tablets. It was pretty much just Windows on them. Um, you know, and so the, a lot, there are some naysayers in the iPad, you know, coming out against the, the iPad. And it really kind of remains to be seen what the overall market will be. I think, I think we're looking at, you know, a sizable market. I think this is really the, the computer for everybody. This is something that I would recommend, like, my mom gets, my grandmother gets. It's that sort of class of device where, you know, it may not be for the power user because of the keyboard, because of that kind of strange interaction, um, maybe because you don't have access to the file system, but it's going to be the computer that is, has the ease of use and the kind of lack of, of um, techno prob problems that the iPhone has, you know? So, so system updates and things like that. Um, yeah, right now the iPad is going to be docked to a computer, but overall it's still going to work. You know, you're not going to have trouble um, with iWork, you know, requiring a patch and not working at all or it having trouble finding, you know, all of your printers and things like that. It's designed, you know, really, really fundamentally to work. And so it's a different class of device. I've got another picture here. Um, <laughs> that super cool. So it's, it's probably not just marketing that this fails. It really is the user experience. It's the bundling, you know, the iBook store and things like that. But is, you know, is the iPad kind of the beginning and the end of the story? No. Um, it's going to be successful because of all of the bundling, because of the, the, uh, the kind of walled garden that is Apple. But there are going to be other devices. If you look out um, on, on the web, you'll see, like at CES, there were a bunch of, of Android, some Android devices. You know, there's the, there's, HP came out with the Slate that's a Windows-based device, which will probably fail like the other ones in 2001. But the, you know, the, there's the Android device, there's potentially Chrome running on, um, on, uh, on tablet form factor devices. And so you really, you know, it's going to come down to, is it the walled garden approach um, or something a little bit more open? And as far as des designing applications, um, it's really, you know, around, um, you know, what, what is your user base really looking for? Um, you know, the, the, uh, the user, your, your user base wants a simple application, the same sort of thing that you're seeing in the iPhone. Um, so you really have to take, in, you know, take a hard look at, the, as far as the future, the, you've got, uh, sorry, I'm just totally spaced. Uh, yeah, you, 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 you know, if you're going to give them access to the file system, which you can, you can open it up, you know, in Android, and, and potentially even apps on the iPad will be able to do that. But is that really what your users want? So it's, it's you know, just a pro kind of thought-provoking thing to think. You know, how, how open does it need to be to be successful? How much openness will potentially affect the user experience in a way that degrades from the user experience and effectively makes it less successful? Um, I didn't. I haven't seen anybody actually come up with the use, uh, the user case. I mean, who who is this built for? I mean, I, I think I that was pretty clear on the iPhone. But who do you? Who do each of you think the I, iPad was built for? I mean, who who's going to buy it? I mean, I think that the joke was that when it came out. I, I I think you came up with this. Um, I always know somebody else that would want it. Right? This would be good for this other person. Everybody else came up with this would be good for this other person, but not that. So I, I'm just curious, curious what each of you think that the next, who, who this was built for, who will buy it? And I think it's kind of fundamentally not this group, right? <laughs> I mean, I think that's probably why we have a hard time seeing, you know, who is this for because it's not us. You can't, like, crack open a shell or, you know, um, kind of do, it's not, it's not a laptop, it's not a netbook. So I, it's, it's... I actually came up with, with, with one that, the one use case and one person that really wants it really bad. 
and that's that's my father, and I, he has a specific use case for it. But it's interesting. I'm wondering what you guys. Yeah, think it's it. kind of a low maintenance. I mean, it will be for it's like it's for everybody and everybody else. I mean, it's it's it'll be for users like us. It'll be the e-reader, right? I think, and and for a lot of other people, it'll be their actual only connection to the internet. I think it has a huge student use case. Yeah. I can tell you as a five foot girl, my feet don't even reach the ground with these chairs, um, <laughs> that college was made of my existence because I had a backpack full of books and I had an old school laptop that was just the heaviest thing ever. And I walked around with a backache for years. The thought of having all of my textbooks, my ability to take notes, my ability to write a paper, all on a really small device is mind-bogglingly awesome. So I think it really has the potential to revolutionize education. I think business women is actually a very similar use case. I cannot wait to travel because my laptop always feels like too much. And my iPhone, I'd start shaking if I had just my iPhone, and I'm a huge <laughs> iPhone you know, believer. So I think there's a lot of, and it's the perfect weekend device. Even for a power user, like I'm not gonna wireframe on it much, I don't think. <laughs> but um, on the weekend, when I'm just checking email and watching a movie and play, doing a crossword puzzle, heck yeah, it's, it's going to have a huge use case for me. Yeah, I would say a considerable percentage of people who walk into an Apple store and touch one. So this is the feedback we got from the press who were there. And many of them were ho-hum uh, going in about a tablet device. And then they touched it and they go, wow, I can't articulate what happened to me when I spent five minutes with the thing, but oh my god. I'll find a reason to have this thing. Like, I, I will create a context for which to justify purchasing this thing. Isn't that a fundamental problem, though? Because it's like the TiVos. The TiVos took forever to catch on because everybody that had one thought it was the best thing in the whole world. But people who didn't, what the heck is the big deal? But it's, it's, it's a mobile that. device, so you have it out with you, right? Mm -hmm. You'll be able to show it to other people. Whereas your TiVo was in the basement. I think the iPad also has a, has a really, one, I want to double up. The education thing, I think, is gigantic. And not only, like, uh, George Fox University just down the road, they're going to be issuing those to their students next year. And so, like, they're jumping right on that bandwagon. And I know they're not the only school, but, uh, but the education opportunities are monstrous. And not only just for classrooms and textbooks and all that, but anybody who's doing that kind of uh, educational content for, for video, uh, for printed stuff, for charts, that's going to be massive, and the ability to, to deliver that stuff, whether it's uh, just kind of online, uh, is going to be monstrous. And I also think you have a, a, a unique opportunity for a multi-user application. That's it's a place now where I can put this in the middle of the table, and we're all interacting with something, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's going to be a really unique way to start using that tool. Well, the publishers will push it because yeah. it takes a, out the secondary market. They're basically making money out of the secondary market. So I was commenting earlier to these guys when I. When I bring one home, it's going to be the biggest source of family problems that we've had in a long time because I only brought one. And there's no multi-use remote. I mean, I'm not going to put my email account on there and let my kids use it for three hours. But everything that the kids do, everything my wife does, there was never demo. So, hard to yeah. Everything they do, they're going to be able to do all that. Josh, I'm actually going to throw out a really interesting use case because I work for Multnomah County. And uh, the moment this came out, CIO and several people from the facilities were saying, that's the form factor we've been looking for. And what they've been looking for it to use um, is basically as something for people who are mobile, who need to go all around the city, particularly the 3G model, and who need to enter work orders. Because the form factor for, like, say, the UPS stuff, uh, the, uh, you know, the UPS has their little thing that they pop out. We tried that. And the memory's horrible on it, the experience is horrible, it's hard to train people, it's too hard to read. But the idea of something bigger, the problem will become that it's not ruggedized. And two, they'll have to come up with what type of apps would you actually be able to run on it. You'd have to run a business version of iTunes, download a business app that you had had custom developed with security built into it. But the form factor and the user interface is exactly right for dealing with anything that is a mobile work order based system. So, so that's my background. I actually do use it. Yeah. My past background, I used to do like enterprise, billboards, automation stuff. And it's interesting because it's a it's a case where people think that's the form factor they want, but in reality, it's weird because it, it doesn't end up working out with them because they, they where do you put it? You know, a lot of people go with like truck based things that are mounted in a truck and don't ever move. So like Motorola sells some of those, and, and yeah, all the other old ones aren't very good that are on the market. 
But it does become an issue where kind of what you think, it's a, you know, even in the consumer market, like what you think you want and necessarily what you want at the end of the day might be two different things. Well, it's like somebody developing the apps. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, that's a huge opportunity, though, too. Yeah, yeah. Over here. Come over to Jeff. I've got a question about video. Um, I'm assuming it's going to work kind of the pass through to, to uh, YouTube um, on the web or even through apps. The other I can imagine is just an in app kind of video survey. Is there going to be any other way that video is going to be able to be displayed um, on the iPad? I mean, I know they've rejected Flash. I know there's some capability with HTML5, but is it just going to be limited to what's available on the iPhone, which is YouTube, or it's got to be? It's not limited. Yeah, some of the stuff is outlined in the documents you get given the program, so I don't think I can go into I mean, it's nothing mind blowing or different. It's probably what you expect. But if you look at the screenshots of what was demoed, the YouTube app had an inline video playback. Uh, and then Apple on the iPhone has a video player that if it sees an HTTP stream with an HTTP 4 or QuickTime binary format, it then just intercepts it and does a full screen player. And we would assume, we have not seen a demo of that, that it would do a similar sort of environment. If you, if you go to um, Vimeo's site um, on your iPhone, they, they've adapted to um, HTML5 streaming, and it's really quite oh, nice. Oh, okay. Let's check that out. Oh, actually, I guess I said Jeff, and then uh, for the publishers of Sandmark, um, so have you guys talked about the business side of things and how I mean, you have Apple kind of trying to get in the middle of your relationship. You yeah. guys usually deal directly with publishers. How would all that work from an economics? Um, yeah, so we we work um, with publishers and we bring them into the iTunes store. Uh, they're actually excited about it because what they were, the people that we talk to are the newspapers and the magazines. They're not excited about Amazon. The amount that Amazon's been taking, um, and they're not excited about what the carriers have been doing. Because carriers take even more. Uh, so, you know, up to now, they're, they're they are they did look at it as an opportunity to, to try out some new models, and, and it's a safe place to do it as opposed to uh, you know, Apple's been good at this, so sort of sneaking in and saying, "Yeah, we're safe. We're, we're not going to." We're not going to change the music industry. No, no, trust us. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so there is, um, I'd say that the sort of coolness factor outweighs the, the concern. Uh, I would just add to that that Skype and Salesforce, Salesforce.com, which both have free iPhone apps, make lots of money off of iPhone users by having a subscription relationship on the back end that Apple does not monetize. But Apple has very rigid requirements around how you do sign-ups from device. You can't actually create a paying relationship with your customer in a free app in a subscription model that doesn't use Apple's payment backend but inside of the app. You have to go to a web experience, either ejecting you out to mobile Safari or having the user go back to the desktop, create a subscription relationship with a recurring payment structure, and then log them back in later. As the other the other mobile platforms right now are it's really difficult to buy anything. Like when you go to the Android store, there's no direct bill. It's really hard. And the same on, on Blackberry. And I think that the publishers are learning that and they're like, well, yeah, they'll take more, but at least we we, can, we have an opportunity to, to make it. Yeah, it's, there's I know the rules are you have to have a subscription already online that in the Skype app, you can create a new Skype account by doing by Skype credits for, for dialing. You have to leave the app and probably go to a desktop PC and type in a credit card because it's the experience is pretty out on mobile. But if you want to buy a Kindle book, you should go outside. Yes, you do. But there's a Tommy Hilfiger app you can buy product right through. Yeah, that's a physical relate. That's a physical sh something being shipped. So it's more along the lines of opposed to an information service subscription, which is content, digital. Apple has strict rules, but yeah, that's a good point. Okay, if you were to fix your ultimate mobile app, mobile device, how would you rate this compared to the uh, to all the things you'd really want in, uh, in a portable tool? I see my iPhone as my notification device. I'm going to have it in my pocket always unless I'm showering or sleeping. Right? And this thing is going to be, if I'm sitting on the couch at home, um, day trips, I mean, these are the sorts of things I see. But laptops, I, I need a laptop for a lot of reasons that this is not. It's not a replacement for a phone. I don't see it as a replacement for a phone. And I think that's why I, at the mobile show, I didn't hear a lot of talk about it, because they're like, yeah, this is a replacement for what we sell today. It's an extension. So, yeah, so I've got a question, but first I just want to find a couple of people. 
you're right about not replacing the phone. Apple's not stupid. They're not going to put out something that cannibalizes their own while it's still so successful. Um, and the other comment that, I'm sorry, the gentleman on the left, I don't know your name. Chris. Chris. I'm Tom Kingsley, by the way. I'm a proud company. I'm Dave Shanley's partner. So the comment that you made at the very end, which is that there were uh, phones around, but until Apple came out with the iPhone, nobody really got the smartphone right. Apple has shown again and again that they have this ability to execute where they deliver a user interface that connects with the broad population, not just the enterprise community. And you hit right on with that. And, and so because of that, this is going to be a lot bigger than most people in the technical community really give credit for. So we need to watch that. Dave hit on an important point, which is the form factor, which is really key. The smartphone's good because it's pocketable. So the question, where does the iPad go? I think there's a great opportunity there. I think you're going to see all sorts of bizarre things that people come up with to hold your iPad, backpacks or whatnot. So that's the opine. My question to all of you guys is, Apple is a really sophisticated, big, smart company. They must have projections about who's going to buy this and how many are going to be sold. Of course, they don't share that publicly, but and they're very good about controlling leaks, but I'm wondering if anybody has any data or has heard of anybody who has rumors of any data from Apple about where Apple thinks it's going to be sold. Um, some uh, analysts in the vast community in New York have, I think, what, four to six million year, first year, first calendar year, 12 month. But that's based on an Excel spreadsheet that they built. I mean, it's, <laughs> and it's just numbers. It's not actually breaking the demographic down. I think your best indication of that is actually how they positioned it in the keynote. I mean, even down to the, the art that they used to promote the event with the paint splatters, it was very much marketed in that event as an everybody device. You know, you're going to watch Star Trek on it. You're going to, you know, fill in a spreadsheet about your kids' soccer teams on yeah. it. It was very much positioned in the content that they showed as an everybody's device. And I think, you know, if that data isn't out there, you can definitely see that sort of point of view in the way that they, they talked about it. They sold a picture the first year? Uh, first year was... No, it was 10 million. I think it was eight. They got to nine point something or yeah. 11 or it's yeah. so. I mean, I think I, I personally, I think you know, everybody that we know in this room and then one degree of separation know 10 million people that are going to buy this thing. You know, there's that many math mathematics out there that are going to do it. So I think I think it's like the, it breaks out to there's going to be an affluent component, like an affluent buyer that this is their third device. Right, and then it's also going to be. It's, it's also going to be the um, you know the everybody else. I mean, the the largest growing demographic for the iPhone is, is lower income people. Yeah. So, so. um, so I want to I want to ask a follow up on this because this is this is everybody talks about the fact that the the iPad is the device for the people who don't necessarily like. They don't need to have a complex computer, right? It's going to make it very simple. You know, you've got your apps, you don't have to worry about it. Um, how in the world will this work without a computer? Because as far as I can tell, it won't. <laughs> because you can't do system updates, you can't print, um, you can't do backups. Like, You'll yeah, bring into it house for <laughs> No, I, I think those are going to be sh really short lived components. And one of the reasons about that is that. I know, for example, with the education angle, those the, these colleges want to sell these things. And, and, and Apple's going to see, they've got the beautiful communist model here. Like, you get these things into the hands of kids, and they're going to care for them their whole lives. And so you kind of, when you realize that the colleges are going to be pressing for some sort of file integration, they need to be able to print files just to turn in your paper. That stuff's going to happen. Yeah. And so, uh, so the assumption is then that, that, like, like first, that you guys haven't you guys haven't seen anything that I haven't seen that actually says that this stuff is coming. Like, well, they, they, they said that the libraries are there. For people right? people, oh. people have, like looked in. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The people who yeah. cracked it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm a I'm a life, I'm a life coach. I work with a lot of uh, high school and college students, and what they're talking about is some of the college students I'm working with are saying that the colleges are actually going to buy these devices and hand them out to all of the students. But similar to what they're doing with iPod Touches and even with some laptops are requiring Apple. So it, like, that's exactly what Apple's going to do. They're going to put it into a few key universities 
It's going to become a status symbol, and then it's going to be made cool by you know college students, and so everyone else will want to hop on this. Okay. So there's a huge well, opportunity to, to build some management software. <laughs> 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 right, that's going to manage all these technical yeah. options. Well, yeah, technology. I mean, if you're looking into it, I think the other big market is baby boomers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I wonder about price points. I mean, obviously, the iPhone came down. I'm thinking, okay, my wife and I want to read the paper. So we're going to read it on an iPad. But do we want to spend $1,000 to show us this? At what price does that have to come down before the market says, okay, it's time, you know, I can afford it now, it's worth it, uh, I'm going to buy two, I'm going to buy some of that. Plenty of people spent 700 bucks just to use the phone. What's that? Plenty of people spent 700 bucks just to use the phone. I think I supplied it like a breakdown just look for hardware and it's like one eighty, one hundred eighty dollars. So yeah. I'm sure there is uh, some room to lower the price later. Um, so somebody asked about commercial applications. I know that BMW Korea is going to buy the unit for every salespeople so that they can actually swap their customers to the car, show the colors, and have them configure the vehicles as they're seeing it in person. That's a good so, yeah. That's one example. And then when they put it down, they'll be worried about where it goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other, the other thing I want to mention was, so Gray Stripe on the advertising side has a capability of transcoding flash. So you just give them a flash file and they transcode it for the iPhone. So wouldn't they be able to do that on the web application side as well? You think about all the services that are proxies, whether it's an anonymizer or these others. Imagine a business model for one of you in this room to create a site that basically transcodes Flash and other services H.264, so you can visit any website from your iPad and have the same experience as though you were actually at Flash Department. It's one example of something that can be done by the third-party community that Apple probably will not do. Uh, the, uh, all the different platforms, I mean, uh, the Android, 7 to 10 inches, the uh, iPad, the, uh, uh, the Migo. And, uh, and they're not going to, and so that's just what we're doing. There's the opportunities for us and other people like us to service them. Also, the other devices are significantly, I mean, there were only prototypes of Android and things like that out there. It remains to be seen kind of. Most of those are from, I mean, you know, way on. Most, most of those are from kind of like second tier manufacturers. Yeah. I had a question about, um, very much for James, about wireframing. You said that you probably don't do too much wireframing on it. Um, I, I actually saw this, I, I'm not an Apple user. I love the company and they do great things. I never like an Apple product. But I actually see this as something that I might actually buy just because I think you might have mentioned that Omnigraffle. Yeah, Omnigraffle is coming. So <laughs> do you see, I, I would expect that, that something like you would really be excited about that and might, might, because I also don't think about that too much. I'm not exactly the greatest um, assessment for this, but um, I see this as, as a way that I could actually make wireframes with the client in the room, which I really never do except for so, do you see uh, as a as a as a U.S. person if you aren't if you don't think you're going to be using it, do you think that's it? Oh, I think I'm going to be using it, just not for wireframe, right? So I would use it for any other documentation, right? Personas, which I do in in Keynote, wireframing in particular, I'm moving a lot of boxes and arrows around like one pixel at a time to get it to be visually um, beautiful and. Until I try that on the iPhone, I don't know how well I'm going to be able to do that with such a fat tap target and how fine-tuned I will be able to make wireframes because it is a pixel-perfect sort of science. Um, and in terms of collaborating with the client, that's you know what I usually use whiteboards for. Yeah. And so, I mean, and that's great because you hand everyone a marker and everyone, if you've got a room of 20 people, if you've got a room of 10, you know you can do that on the whiteboard. So I actually see... I mean, I'm going to have, I can tell you that my family's going to have two devices, so my husband and I don't have to fight over it. 
Um, and I am definitely, I, I'm a believer in the business use case. I'm going to take it to meetings, I'm going to take notes on it, it's going to be a great email device. But I think it remains to be seen whether I can actually get fine-tuned granularity enough to, to do something as precise as wireframing. And I hope to be surprised. Yeah. But I also love, I have one of the big 27-inch iMacs, and I love to like have my huge palette set in front of me, too. So I mean, I, I know that something at that form factor will never replace that just beautiful white canvas in front of me. So um, Elia and I think somebody over here had a question. Oh, maybe not. Okay, so you <coughs> So Apple's pushing us for all part of ship one app that runs on all the platforms. What are you guys thinking? One app or two? Thankfully, they bumped the, to 20 meg for 3G download limit last week. That's going to help a lot, but depends on the experience. I mean, there's fundamentally different experiences. What screenshots would you use to express your app? Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's some interesting challenges. I, I feel pretty strongly that the really, so the, the reason the iPhone wins, the reason I went into making iPhone apps is because they're inherently gorgeous. I don't think the interaction that you're going to see when blown up twice the same size is going to feel as good. I believe that the use cases, the context that you expect most people to use the two different devices in are different enough that you're going to want a slightly different UI, perhaps a slightly different feature set. And so because of that, I think we're going to see a lot of companion apps. Um, but I, I think that you know universal apps are not going to feel as good. But um, sort of follow up on that, um, pricing. Do you guys think that um, prices will go up, the average point per app? I didn't hope so. I see yes, they're going up, but then you have big players like Angie Mocha, which announced they're going all freemium. So they're going to a free, all their games are going to be free from here on out, and they're going to monetize their upsell in app commerce because the piracy issue goes away, and there's a the compulsion aspect of it, which means you monetize, you know, the, high, the 1% are going to spend 60% of the revenue uh, on that game. And they just today they announced their 25 million C series venture fund, and they went and bought Freeverse, uh, another very large uh, iPhone game. So we're now starting to see the emergence of an EA-like uh, publisher in the iPhone space, which is pretty interesting. Do you think people value like the fact that the form factor is larger and like sort of? Uh, I mean, maybe I mean Apple at the keynote is showing off, or not the keynote, whatever the hell they're calling it now, um, is showing off productivity apps that maybe. You know, like you end up in a space where people people just value apps at a larger form factor as a higher price point. Like, Probably. Or is it just that people learn their lessons in the last round and might actually charge more? I do think in gaming, the, the, the sense that we that we couldn't get over is there was a psychological barrier that said that only 99 cents could fit in here. And it didn't matter the scope of your game, it didn't matter how many hours you spent, how much money you spent. There was a sense like, well, that's a 99 cent product that goes on that little thing. Thing. And it, it, so it was a weird psychology, but we saw it over, over and over again. There's, so there's a psychology too. About yeah. The price point and the price you pay for the hardware. When you pay two thousand for a PC, paying two hundred bucks. For it a seems reasonable. Well, yeah. Apple also, I mean, Apple initially, right, right. I mean, they initially kept the price ceiling quite low to generate interest and generate volume. So I was talking with Brian Greenstone, who uh, runs Pangea. He does Chromac Rally and Enigma and Nanosaur, and these games bug them. He said to me, and during a panel talk at South by Southwest, that when they were backstage at developer conference uh, June 2008, when they were first showing a whole bunch of native apps getting ready to go, that all the guys in the backstage were like, hey, what are you going to price that? And everyone was kind of like, I don't know, $9.99? And everyone was like, yeah, that sounds good to me. That they didn't even know a month before the app store opened how they were going to price. Everything started at $9.99 and then very quickly dropped $4.99 and then down to $1.99 and $9.99, which is now the, the common place for people. I think another big part of it is that for many, many years, the telecos have been hammering up everybody that everything costs 99 cents or 49 cents, or, you know, they've been hitting the market with their price points for anything get over the phone, and everybody's been fighting against that in a way. Yeah. Well, the, iTunes didn't help. I mean, that kind of yeah. set people, they're already in the same area, yeah. so they're used to paying 99 cents. No? I think we need to take a longer, we need to take a longer view, longer trend and look at this. I think all the problems we're talking about are one or two year problems, reflective of the fact we don't know any details of the product at all. Um, <laughs> I think what they're doing is they're winning the next generation of computer users. 
uh, they're on target education, just like in the mid 80s. They target education, they won over the next generation of users. And also, under Clayton, all this is effective. They developed their own damn silicon for this. They made their own ships for this thing. Uh, they're going to win the next generation of computing, is the way I look at it. The problems will get worked out, problems always get worked out. What kind of generations have I possibly been through? Um, I don't know what it's going to be, but. I'll buy one. I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> when you look at the, when you, I mean, when you look at the SDK and you think, like, see what they did to it, you definitely see like the future of using a computer, right? Like the gestures. Like, yeah. You definitely see it's, it's sort of the next evolution, and this stuff's going to bleed back, back into. It's also, I think, the ultimate expression of a cloud computing platform. Everyone talks about cloud computing. This is the manifestation of cloud computing right here at a Fortnite Internet price point. Yeah, it's like um, uh, Scott McNeely when they announced the PIN client years ago. And this is this is the device my grandmother's going to use. Everything will be up on the net. He was absolutely right. He was only about 15 years ahead of the program. Like Bill was 10 years ago. Like yeah. 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 so a couple more questions and then. Um, I, have one more, I have one more suggestion. Can we do a straw man poll with the people in here and just ask the question? We've heard people saying over and over again, well, I don't know about this, but I'm going to buy one. So I'm wondering how many people here, based on what you know about the iPad, think you'll buy one? <laughs> <laughs> And I didn't mean for development. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question, actually. I have a question. I'm interested in the panel's opinion on, because we built this intimate relationship with this integrated device, which was the iPhone, do you see that this new device now is going to put the two at odds, where there's going to be moments where you really enjoy one, and there's going to be ones where you really enjoy the other, and you find that with one device, you're forced to kind of go to it and kind of work your way through some of the subtle nuances of what the device does for you. Do you find yourself in that position now where you're going to be like, well, I want this one that time, and I want this one that time, and that's exactly what I didn't want with an integrated device. I wanted one. I'm, I'm already fighting that battle with my nightstand device. So one of the most amazing things about the iPhone to me, the way it fundamentally changed my personal life in a way I never expected, is that I sleep next to my iPhone. It's the last thing I do before I go to sleep most nights is I check in on my world. It's the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I check in. And before, before I had my iPhone and I just had a brick phone, like I left it charging in the kitchen and didn't want to have anything to do with it. I'm curious, and most nights I actually read on the Kindle app on my okay. phone, believe it or not. Um, and I can't wait to see what wins on my nightstand. I'm, I'm dead <laughs> curious. Because I can't imagine actually not having my phone with me because we don't have a home phone. Right. Um, but at the same time, when I get to be able to read a book on an iPad, like I'm not going to want to read it on, on my iPhone. You just and need so a bigger nights bigger. I do. <laughs> <laughs> iPad things for the nightstand industry. <laughs> Boom for the nightstand <laughs> Just a, these last two questions. Yeah. I just want to add a comment. The iPhone will win for you guys default because it's always in my left pocket. Yeah. Unless I'm sleeping or showering, and that's I'm not an under, that's not an overstatement. And if I don't have the iPad here or here or feel like I have the energy to go and get it from someplace, it goes I go my hand goes in my pocket. I think I think that I mean from our perspective, the iPhones, I mean or just generally mobile phones, because everybody carries them with them. And there's there's just I just don't see any way that, that no matter how successful the iPad is, that it's going to it's going to be bigger than the iPhone. Like mobile phones are just way too well, big. Think about it like how many people own multiple digital cameras. Right. right. It's the same kind of idea. You have one the best one's the one you have with you, but you yes. also have a really yeah. good yeah, one. The number one, one yeah. so the number one manufacturer of digital cameras is Nokia. <laughs> but when you use it less, that's sort of I'm wondering is when you would all the functionality you have in the iPhone today move to the pad and then you end up with like a little razor basically that is good for talking and I mean, it's not so good for talking. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I have a question. Uh, with the iPad they announced this the camera kit that you attach to it that you can get uh, photos of your camera with. And uh, you know, with the, when the iPhone launched there was this whole thing about uh, 
people making hardware that attaches to it. And I'm just wondering if there is, if you see hardware opportunities of things that attach with the iPad and you know widgets in the real world, communicating with the device and through the cloud to it. Uh, you know, if you see that kind of thing happening with the iPad in any way. I mean, I, I don't know how long, how much it has taken off in the iPhone. I really haven't seen that many devices that do that. It is like three or four now, and um, Apple has a pretty restrictive uh, process of applying for the hardware accessory API. It's called the WWI, MFI, or the WWI program, it works with iPad or made for iPhone. And uh, there's, you know, radio tuner and GPS integration and some other things that have come out. But generally, most of the integration has been sound uh, controlling for docking stations and these sorts of things. Sorry. Um, okay. oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to go back to um, to Seth's question about uh, user base and uh, target market. Who's this really for? Although I think the poll kind of sorted that out a little bit. Um, and I think one thing that a lot of people overlook when they ding the lack of multi um, the lack of multitasking is the value of an exclusive user experience. Because I think for all of us who are technical, we sit down with a laptop and our work is never more than a command tab away. And you know, we might want to just sit down and read the paper. We might want to just sit down and read Newsweek, but we could be, you know, get up stuff popping up in our faces of IMs and tweets and things. And if you sit down with this with the iPad and you could, you can only do that one thing, you know, a newspaper is a single use technology, a magazine is a single use technology, it's an exclusive user user experience. And so you sit down with anything on the iPad and, and it really sort of captivates you and says, Okay, well this is all I can do right now. Just like on the iPhone when you're reading, but like to James's point, like a deeply sociological experience of people right. are exhausted with multitasking. Right. Yeah, I think people are exhausted with multitasking. I think if you put something in front of them, that's even if it's a even if it's a magazine rack that you can read through a bunch of different magazines on, you can only use one of those at a time. I mean, just because of the way that the the user interface works, and I think that's actually a, a plus for so the, the device. So the one the one the one thing that I see and that I wonder about in relation to that is actually um, the calculator and the here sort of. So seeing Elias sort of makes me think about this, but if you're if you're on a web page and somebody's got like you're viewing something on the iPad and you, and you like want to add up something, mm -hmm. right? Like like to not be able to have a little like dashboard widget or something that you can. I mean, like, and I'm not I'm not talking about like I totally get what you're saying about the focus, um, but it seems like there's it seems like there's an element of it that's not like and and plus like what. How big is that calculator going to be? Like this is—it's one of the apps that they yeah. haven't shown yet. Well, that's—I mean—and that, that's that gets to the question of whether a dashboard is actually kind of in yeah. the wings. But, but you have the experienced designer who's created a web experience that requires you to think about add numbers that you want to add up might you know include that, right? Like if I were designing a, a finance app, I might have a little popover that's a nice calculator that you can build. Just like you're reading a website. You're like reading rates or something. I mean, I just, I mean, it seems like there's information gathering that happens that are, is outside of an app context where you might need to add something. Well, think about Can you just take out your iPhone? Yeah, it's your iPhone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, okay, so we're at 730. Um, there were two questions up here. Should we grab them just real quick and then go? Um, okay, let's do it. So, right there in the green shirt and then in the red shirt and then that's it. And then they'll still be here. You can harass them. <laughs> well, I, I was just going to make the point that uh, uh, family friends of ours, th th this last Christmas, they, I think, added three iPod Touches to the family. We've been talking a lot about the iPhone kind of competing with the iPad, but I think that the iPod Touch uh, may get pushed out in a number of cases. People, families just around the house, uh, each individual checking their Facebook, reading the web, maybe, maybe those... Uh, purchases would go to an iPad instead, uh, a personal device like that. So it's really not necessarily uh, competing in that case with an iPhone. I don't know. So I, I can see that market really uh, taking off that direction. Um, my question is, um, there's obviously a lot of excitement about the iPad uh, because of the new user as well as the new developer opportunities uh, that it presents. But I was wondering, even though it's certainly a, a refinement on the tablet and will no doubt sell quite a few units, uh, is there any is there anyone here that feels that it might more or less still go the way the tablet computer did go in when it after it was introduced in terms of not really catching on to as much?
much as uh, a lot of the hope. No science. I, I think that if Apple didn't have hundreds and hundreds of retail stores, then I would be perhaps less aggressive on their growth numbers. But I think there is, in the same way when someone walked in and <coughs> tried it, there are so many people I've met who say I had no interest in an iPhone, and I, walk, I saw a friend's iPhone, or went into an Apple store and fell in love. This is even more so the case now. Uh, is people going in, going, I don't need a tablet, and then they touch it. Like a lot of these press folks who said, I was, you know, I was caught up in the magic. Right? I, I, I touched the thing, and in five minutes I realized that I, I would find a, a justification at home myself. That thing will happen as well. I think, I think the bigger risk is will the other devices, like the Android-based devices, and things like that, will they try, will they fall out? Because, yeah. I mean, will they try to compete on, like, feature function so, yeah. and miss the point yes. and just sort of go the way it's done? Yeah, I think that the touch thing becomes a real critical deal. It, it, it seems to me that where so many people with other smartphones, they buy a phone that happens to play apps. People buy iPhones because it plays apps and it's got a phone. And so I think they come from a totally different angle. And I think the touch is a place where they're interacting with their digital world where they never could before. And that is the secret. I want to add one more comment to that. When the <coughs> tablet PCs came out, and I know I was trying to make money writing some software for them, they were priced higher than laptops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's no way anybody who was sane was going to run out and buy one of those things. <laughs> they could pay a thousand dollars less to less and buy a laptop computer. So I think they shot themselves in the foot just on the price point. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking about five hundred bucks versus a thousand dollar laptop or a, you know, a two hundred dollar phone, but it's really not a two hundred dollar phone because it's really a two hundred dollar phone plus another exactly. four billion dollars <laughs> a year. And, and <laughs> <laughs> Basically, one block that direction is Protus Row, which is a bar where people will probably head out. And um, thank you all for coming.